Welcome back to another edition of the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. I'm your host, Justin Mark. This week, we've got an interesting topic of conversation revolving around how does crypto meaningfully impact economic freedom in the world? And maybe to make it more specific, two paths to doing this. The big central question is how can we increase crypto's adoption in the world? And the two paths here are, number one, talking about blockchain gaming, GameFi. This is how cryptocurrencies and blockchains can be integrated into games and serve as a meaningful hook to get more users into the crypto economy. And the second part is seeing how GameFi and how this play to earn economy, this whole emerging ecosystem is impacting some developing countries, notably Vietnam, where we've seen an explosion of crypto interest and adoption in a very meaningful way. So I have with me today, Howard Aju. He is the founder and uh, CEO of Ancient8. This is Vietnam's largest blockchain gaming guild. They're building social and software platforms for GameFi, enabling everyone in the end to hopefully build and play in the metaverse. So he is exactly the right person to talk to about this. It's a great conversation and let's jump in. I'm excited to get into this because I think there's a lot of confusion around what you know crypto gaming and uh, GameFi and play to earn economies look like. Uh, I'm excited about though because I think that you know this is an avenue for crypto to onboard millions, potentially billions of people. So you know we want to dive into a couple different topics here. We want to talk about GameFi, talk about play to earn economies, and we also want to talk about how this is impacting developing countries like Vietnam, and we're seeing a lot of new crypto adoption in these developing countries. So maybe to start it off though. We'd love to get a sense from you on, you know, how you got involved in this space and, and why it's exciting and, and important for you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I started getting into crypto in 2017 uh, when I was an investor at Genfund, which is this angel arm for Sequoia China. Um, we were pretty, you know, active in the 2017 timeframe uh, in investing crypto and we're the very early investor for Huobi, for uh, Anchor Protocol, Ember Group. IOST, among a few others. Um, I got into crypto since then and have held my back since then and have always been closely following crypto. Uh, I, I went back to, you know, building companies in Web2 and also in VC in Web2 as well at Inside Partners, which is a $90 billion fund. But I've always stayed pretty close to the entire crypto ecosystem. Um, and with the development of DeFi in 2020, um, and the different, you know, Lego blocks in the entire crypto ecosystem brewing, uh, and also the takeoff of Axie Infinity in, you know, middle of 2021. Uh, I really believe it is the time for, you know, the entire application layer for crypto to really get adoption today. And we started Ancient Aid at, on that premise, you know, uh, in the middle of 2021. Uh, we started as initially a, a guild and then expanded to starting to build uh, multiple different softwares for the entire GameFi ecosystem because we believe that GameFi is the space, the subsector that's going to bring out maybe hundreds of millions, if not billions of people onto crypto. And we believe that as an industry, you know, blockchain's number one, uh, m number one goal right now is to bring on as many new users as possible. And, and we're going to be a par big part of that. Uh, and in return, right, that also helps. I come from Asia. Uh, that also helps with the the community that I care deeply about um, with getting exposed to a new technology that's exciting that can potentially help them, you know, leapfrog a lot of the other countries. That, that's sort of how we got into it. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is uh, really exciting for a number, a number of dimensions, because I think just taking the naive approach here that, oh, it's exciting because gaming and crypto can make games better and it can offer people to crypto. But both things are exciting, right? Number one, we can make games better. We can actually add new dimensions to them, you know, new features, new economies, et cetera. But that other part that, hey, can onboard people to crypto is also equally exciting. And I'm going to get on my little like uh, shill horse here a little bit and talk about Coinbase's mission. But um, I'm a longtime Coinbase employee and uh, I, I admit that I drink Kool-Aid sometimes. <laughs> but um, yeah. why that's exciting to me, though, is, you know, at the end of the day, if crypto gaming can increase the adoption of crypto, it can also have second order effects where the adoption of crypto can bring about more economic freedom in the world which happens to be Coinbase's mission, happens to be what I'm excited about in crypto, broadly speaking, is, hey, let's increase economic freedom, and let's also see a thousand flowers bloom as far as the technology that this can kind of enable. So I'm excited for all of that. Yeah, that, that's really amazing. And I want to jump in as well, because actually Engineate's mission is quite aligned with Coinbase. Our vision that we set out uh, end of last year is to democratize social and financial access in the metaverse. Uh, and, and we started with this premise to bring 
sort of we started in Vietnam, by the way. Um, it's a third third largest country in Southeast Asia uh, with a hundred million population, but average incomes only about two hundred fifty dollars per month, which is not uh, particularly privileged, I would say. And and I grew up in China, uh, and in the last twenty years, we see that the development of technology, mobile internet, really helped China to leapfrog. Many parts of the developed war- world, and it helps China to you know climb up in terms of the average income for the people there. And I see you know people move from the countryside, having you know grow up in the village, to you know living in a metropolitan building, a metropolitan like Shanghai. Whereas where we see the opportunity for Vietnam and many of the Southeast Asia country or other development countries, I think it's very similar in the sense that we see an opportunity to leapfrog with blockchain technology and we see ourselves being the sort of one of the pushing forces to help these communities and these country societies to adopt crypto adopt blockchain uh, and help them to advance as sort of the, the development as a country and improve these people's life economically and financially that that's yeah. sort of our goal and mission as well yeah i mean i, I knew i was going to like you yeah <laughs> I, I have an affinity towards people that are mission driven and, and care a lot about broader ethics in the world and, and trying to see positive change and there's so much potential in crypto for this and so when i meet other founders that kind of are aligned in that dimension there's i just you know there's a click there right i love that um look there's a ton to get into here right i mean i think we're all excited about that broad mission uh but there's also a lot of words we just kind of threw out there in the opening here um and some of them i want to dive into a little bit let's actually start with talking about Kind of what is GameFi? What is crypto and blockchain gaming? So Axie started the movement to you know for people to adopt crypto gaming, uh, blockchain gaming, and GameFi uh, mid year last year. Uh, it's the premise that you know we can leverage blockchain technology and crypto tokens to make the game both fun uh, and also add more ways to play the game and interact with the game, but also help the user own the assets truly own the assets in the game on the blockchain and also generate an income when they play the game and contribute to the community for themselves that are in the form of crypto tokens that they can also cash out to you know become one of their uh, income streams for their lives um, that's how i would think about game five yeah so let's unpack this a little bit um in, can you describe the gaming mechanism inside axi infinity and how exactly does somebody earn you know, a, a living, so to speak, playing this game. Yeah, yeah. So Axie Infinity, the game is developed on chain, uh, on blockchain initially, you know, on one of the layer ones and then move on to uh, rolling chain, their own side chain. Um, and, you know, everything in Axie, the game is uh, a piece of token. Uh, it's whether non-fungible token or fungible token that you can earn by playing the games, uh, including uh, SLP and AXS. Uh, when players play the game, you know, they use the NFT, they have to purchase NFTs to start to play the game, which are axes. Uh, and they use the axie pads to play against the computer, the environment, PVE, or play against other players, PVP, to earn the income by, you know, earn 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 token, in-game token. Similar to how when you play, you know, traditional games, you will earn experience points or gold coins when you play the game. The only difference is that the, you know, the the token that you earn in Axie Infinity is actually cryptocurrency. And you can, there is actually, you know, a market or decentralized or centralized market for exchanging that with fiat or stablecoin. So people can play these games and initially they can earn about $500 to $1,000 per month um, to, you know, by playing these games and they can cash that out as sort of supplementary income for them. And, and Axie took off in the middle of COVID, right? And, and Sinead was educating introducing the Axie Infinity game to a lot of people in Vietnam um, and, you know, helping them, especially the people who lost their jobs during COVID, um, to earn an income by staying home and playing games. Uh, that was actually how Enchanade started. Awesome. Okay, so I, I actually want to kind of get a little bit clearer on this, right? Because I'm actually, you know, I, I grew up playing games and, and uh, this, you know, console games and early, early computer games, but this latest wave of computer games has missed, kind of passed me by. Um, so I'm not natively in the weeds here, but I'm actually curious, what, like, what is the gameplay in Axie? Like, what type of game is it? And Because I want to really understand the, the player mechanic here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a turn-based uh, strategy card game. Uh, if you ever play Pokemon, uh, it, it's a little bit similar to that, but you have three, three Axie pets against another three Axie pets, uh, if that makes sense. Got it, got it. Okay. And so the earning aspect here, right? So obviously some of these cards are more valuable than others. 
Um, I know that in some of these games, right, you kind of have to uh, grind away at the game in certain dimensions to earn better items or earn better cards. And so in my head, what I'm thinking is, okay, well, there are people that are grinding away in Axie, doing a lot of the sort, sort of mundane or, or you know, repetitive tasks to earn some of these higher priced items, higher priced cards, and then they can sell those items or cards to other people. Now, in this case, Axie might actually have a different mechanism where they're actually just getting tokens themselves, and tokens can be used to buy those things. But is that generally the gist of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, even in traditional games like World of Warcraft, like, we see people forming guilds before, you know, um, even though it wasn't sort of a thing that's encouraged by the game, people have been doing it. You, you see guilds that farm gold in World of Warcraft and then trade that with other players in the games who want to, you know, advance quicker. Who want to spend money to buy time in the game essentially um whereas you know in axie's case we actually you know because of blockchain we're able to actually you know open that capability up and actually be like officially approved for people to play the game and earn and and then you'll see people who are spending in the game as well for you know reasons including like saving time or for you know being able to advance quicker uh, and have a bigger say in the game um, so that's that's sort of what blockchain I think opens up, which is you know an activity that was uh, that already exists in traditional gaming, but wasn't encouraged or wasn't possible because of the design of game or limit without blockchain. Yeah, we had a cool conversation with Amy Wu last year on the podcast, and one of her big uh, elements as well was you know there is a sense of ownership here where if you own the items, we're actually moving to a world where the gamers themselves can control more of the game experience. You know, we've yes. seen modding be a big, yes. a big thing in a lot of games too. And this is a step in the direction where, hey, modding can actually become a canonical version of a game at some point if we continue yep. to increase blockchain elements and, you know, we're stepping in that direction. So I think that's also a very important aspect of this as well. Okay, one of the big questions I have though, right, <laughs> is, you know, Axie Infinity is the first of its kind. It's proving out a play-to-earn model using blockchain mechanics. Um, and it's playing around with specific token economics or crypto economics inside of a game. So they've invented two different currencies, SLP and Axie. Um, and they've added it on their own blockchain. They're doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, right? But they're kind of proving the model out in a number of different ways. The question I have to you is, how do you think about the sustainability of this model? If somebody's earning a living, like a minimum wage or you know, a decent living playing this game, well, that money comes from somewhere. And so you know, now we have six to 12 months of a after Axie's real explosion in popularity. How is that economy faring? And is it proving to be sustainable? What should we worry about there, if anything? I will say Axie is still you know, the sort of the beta for entire GameFi world. Right now, a lot of the, you know, source of value comes from the growth still. Uh, and in the in the perfect world or in the more mature world in the games or crypto gaming, we will see people who want to spend because of social reasons, who want to spend because of, you know, because of they want to advance quicker in the game. Uh, the traditional gaming market is about 150 billion market in revenue last year. That means that people spend 150 billion money in games last year that's a lot uh, oh that's all games a, not that's not actually that's all games okay it's all games yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's all games I was like wait a so, second <laughs> traditional gaming yes yeah. um and and that's that's a lot of money that people spend in by for playing games right and we can see that happening in blockchain gaming as well it's just like in the current development stage of blockchain gaming which is still very very early like it, it's only been say about eight nine months since Axie really took off uh, it's still in the infancy of the industry. And we are seeing more and more sort of high quality games being developed in the way that, you know, they design it in the way where they're incentivizing people to spend and they're curating a great, you know, fun game that's going to encourage people to spend more in the game. Uh, and we think that will become, uh, there's, a, there's a very high confidence from us that the, the in-game economy will become sustainable, just similar to the traditional gaming. Okay, interesting. So you mentioned a bunch of high quality games coming out and they're incentivizing people to spend more. My natural question here is like, is that actually a good thing? I mean, do we want, do we want to kind of bring spending to be a first class citizen in gaming? Do we want to bring it to the forefront to that degree? Is gaming, I mean, in my opinion, gaming is kind of all about fun, right? Rather than just spending, but what do you think? Yeah, no, it's all about fun. It's all about fun. I think the, the way the games, we see high quality games projects develop is they, they always prioritize the fun element. Um, and, you know, the, the fundamental design logic for blockchain gaming is also a little bit different uh, because it's community owned, right? Versus, you know, traditional games, you know, they launch on App Store, 
you know, the, the first premise is to make the game fun. And the second premise is to make sure the gaming, the company who developed the game makes money, right? Uh, that's, that's, I guess, the two fundamental drive for uh, traditional games. But in blockchain games, the number one primitive is still make the game fun. But the second primitive is to make sure the community also benefit from it instead of just the company who develops the game. So yeah, that's the, that's the fundamental difference in the incentives. Um, and people are developing games to do that. And the way I say like incentivizing spend is, is just a little bit more so than Axie Infinity, right? Axie Infinity is really very community driven. It doesn't incentivize people to spend much, but you know, compared to Axie Infinity, the new, the new games is both making the games fun and then creating more sort of levers in the game where there are going to be people who earn and people who spend while they are all having fun to make the in-game economy even more sustainable. It reminds me of um, you know, re- remembering Amy Wu's conversation uh, on our podcast earlier. Her her big idea was, you know, look, crypto economics inside games is going to bring a real world economy into the game. And in you know, in the past in Web two, these gaming economies have always been siloed. You know, if you spend money on the game, well, it's only inside that game, and you don't control the economics there at all. It's the money's more or less gone. Like you're spending, it, you're not getting any value back. Um, whereas if it is a real world economy, it makes the gameplay richer because the economies can be more representative of real life. And look, the value that you earn there can be transported and taken with you. And the deeper cut to all of this is that, you know, if you're a new user to a game and you're part of its, its growth history, you know, and you're, you're there at the very early days and you're earning a bunch of items and tokens and what have you, and the game explodes in popularity, well, if the economics are designed correctly, the value of your tokens will also go up, right? And so you actually have a sense of ownership, of like real economic ownership in the future of that game. That can help overcome the, boot, the kind of cold start problem of how do you get new users into a game. It can really engender people to your ecosystem. Like, there's a lot of really powerful psychological hooks behind that. So, I mean, I don't know. If I were to think about gaming and crypto, that would be one of the most exciting hooks that I could think of. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree there. It's it, the, the biggest problem I think crypto enables or solves in, in gaming is that it helps with the initial cold start problem. It leverages the token to help onboard the users and give additional incentives for the early adopters, right? So that more people will try out new things. And that's, that's a challenge that, you know, any market faces right now because, you know, people's attention are limited. Yeah. And, and crypto essentially solved that big problem of, hey, how do we get people excited when the game is still early and new? And yeah. when there are good products that also can acquire enough user very quickly in the beginning with the leverage of crypto, that helps that good product to be discovered by more people more quickly. And that's also, that's what I think crypto unlocks for a lot of these games. And actually, that's also how we as a gaming guild helps the games as well, because we are the expert in game five. We, we look at about 300 games in the last few months. Uh, we look at about 100 games per month. And then the we... Three, 300? Like, yeah. are these all play to earn games? Play to earn games, yes. That's a lot uh, of games coming out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I estimate I'd estimate there are about a thousand games being developed right now that are in Game Five, uh, blockchain gaming, and we we talked to quite a few of them, uh, and it's very very exciting. I think like wherever you see an industry with a thousand new adopters, uh, a new industry, right? It, it's very very exciting. Yeah, I would not have guessed a thousand. I mean, if you had asked me before, I'd be like, oh yeah, probably like twenty to thirty new games in development. No, a thousand. That's a lot. <laughs> are are yeah. these games all kind of like full fledged deep? blockchain integrations like Axie, or are they, yeah. you know, sh- more shallower integrations? They're all deep. Uh, they're all full blockchain games. Um, they, they, they develop the game on the premise that they are going to be a blockchain-based game. So you guys are basically um, providing sort of cold start bootstrapping problems to games and, and on, this, on the liquidity side of adding players to these games and value. Help me understand what you guys do, basically. <laughs> I, can see, yeah. I can see the business model here. Yeah, exactly. You get it exactly right. Uh, and, and the goal here is, you know, we, we open the access, and that's what blockchain does as well. We open the access to these early stage um, opportunities to support early stage projects to not only VCs, but also communities. Anyone who participated deeply in crypto has access to this it's through either us or through the information that we provide. And I think that's what we unlock as well. Um, so a little bit more about Ancient Aid. Um, we are a GameFi infrastructure DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, and we started with three layers. Uh, the first layer being the guild. We have about 2,400 people who we recruit and train and they play the blockchain games. 
uh, and we have about 90k followers on Twitter and 70k in Discord, which is our active community that follows us into you know joining new games and then trying new games and participating in you know crypto games. Uh, the second layer is an education and research and investment layer, and the third layer is the softwares, different softwares that we built for the entire GameFi ecosystem as the infrastructure. So we wrote these investment memos as we talked to these 300 games that we talked to in the over the last few months, hmm. um, and and then started one day like we just realized that hey you know we have all these internal information and a lot of people are ask actually asking us about that you know should be, a lot of crypto VCs actually really appreciate the insights we have and they look at us as the expert in the space, so why don't we you know really formalize this and publish it so that everyone can read it not only us and our friends. But you know, just the general community, the public, can read about it, uh, and we can become sort of uh, this center that offers these free information for people to learn more about GameFi and get into crypto and GameFi, which is our you know vision, anyways. So we we launched GameFi Research Center uh, a week ago, uh, and have been getting really really great traction there. We've launched about five articles on games, including Cyball, Step On. Uh, Summoner's Arena and Skyweaver, and we've launched sort of a macro game five research piece there to you know basically fulfill the vision for us to educate as many people as possible about game five and crypto. The third piece is the different softwares that you know these games can leverage to reach more audience. We're building and going to launch a token and NFT launchpad for games specifically uh, on the Solana ecosystem and will be multi chain in the future. Uh, for games to better advertise and reach, basically the community that have followed us, which are people who are really enthusiastic about games in general, and we're building another GameFi identity product, which will help the different games, you know, better reach their audience as well. Think of it like a distribution layer for GameFi, which more news will come there. So, so these are the three kind of layers that we build as a GameFi infrastructure company: uh, the guild, the education and research center and different softwares. Yeah, I mean, you're also answering the question of, you know, what do people do if they want to get involved? Well, <laughs> go check out the research you guys are putting out, check out the avenues to get involved. But there's probably more tactical ways to get involved. Um, so I guess if somebody did want to become part of your guild, what would, what would they do? What does it look like? Yeah, definitely. So definitely check out the research piece. Uh, I mean, it's the first GameFi-focused research center. Um, and, and the goal is to build an institutional grade free research center for people for everyone to read and get more alpha from uh, on, on the growth of GameFi. Um, additionally, if someone wants to join our community, we have very active community of 70K members in our Discord, and we have 90K followers on our Twitter that we constantly post updates uh, and you know uh, introduction pieces on GameFi. We have about eight streamers on our Discord that constantly streams about teaching people about GameFi and different games. And you can actually get your hands dirty and then start to participate in a game following sort of our tutorial and our, our guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone wants to become a scholar of ours, um, they can also join the Discord. And we have a in, in Discord credit system. And they have to sort of do certain level of contribution to our community and also other games com community to be qualified to become a scholar of ours. And we'll provide more additional training for that as well. Awesome. I want to return though a little bit to just the concept of a guild to begin with, because I think there might be a piece that's slightly missing in my head, right? And it's, you know, what exactly is the value add that a guild provides to these games? Um, and I, I guess like, why, why would somebody uh, approach uh, getting involved in a blockchain game through a guild as opposed to doing it on their own? Yeah, the, the biggest value add there are two pieces. Number one, we're the expert in games and we can really help them get up to speed with the gameplay and train them to become a become a really good player really quickly. That's the number one value we provide. The second value, which is the asset. So for most of these blockchain games, you have to purchase in-game asset, which you know price ranges from anywhere from $500 to $1,000 uh, generally to enter the game. For, for a country like, for people in Vietnam whose you know, average monthly income is about $250 a month, that's a big investment to put in for playing a game and start to earn income. R real so quick, we, what, what, why do these games require you to have you know entities or money before you can get involved? Oh yeah, that, that's you know sort of how these games started to play, and that's also how part of the the gamers why how gamers earn as well. So you have to purchase uh, depend on the game usually three 
uh, in-game assets, which are NFTs, to start playing the game, to start participating in the game. Um, that's how Axie started it. That's what most of the games do today to become part of the community. And you can resell these NFTs uh, if you decided, hey, I don't want to play these games. These are liquid assets. Um, and you can use these game in-game assets, NFTs, to start breeding and uh, breed new assets to sell to other people. That's sort of one of the source of income as well. So I guess the question to you is, you know, when you fast forward 5, 10, 20 years, um, what are the most popular games going to look like? Are they going to come from people that built from blockchain principles first or from uh, Web2 principles first? Yeah, so uh, I think there's always a marriage of the both sides, um, you know, the, the blockchain side and also the uh, gaming side. I think the end goal for us is actually quite aligned, which is to create new games that are very fun, that also leverages blockchain technology so that the gamers can have new ways of interacting with game. And they also truly own the in-game assets and also have an influence in the development of the game or the community of the game. Mm -hmm. okay. Axie Infinity, for example, take, take a lot of you know, advice and guidance from their community. Uh, and that has helped their game to improve a lot. Uh, and I think it's, it, for traditional games, um, one way to look at it is it's almost a new segment of the game, game in, gaming industry. And with anything that's new, right, some people are always going to be skeptical of it. But, you know, pe people were skeptical of uh, a lot of the technology companies that exist today uh, back in the 2000 time frame, you know, hmm. when there's the tech bubble and yeah. the bus of tech bubble. But if we look at where the innovations lie and where the value were created over the last 20 more years, it's in the big tech companies that, that are big today, but also very early on back in 2000s. Yeah. I want to shift gears here. We also kind of wanted to talk about the emergence of crypto adoption in developing countries like Vietnam. Yep. And it's frame, we, we frame the whole discussion so that we talk about gaming first because that's kind of the wedge into these developing countries, you know, and, and starting to spur a lot of crypto adoption. But I wanted to get a sense from you. So, so you know, Ancient 8 is very active in Vietnam. So why Vietnam? And let's dive into this whole, whole realm of crypto adoption in, in these parts of the world. I'm a big believer in technology will help growth of the community and the society. Uh, Vietnam is a, actually a very interesting case. Their adoption to crypto is actually really high because actually my co-founder and also some of the leading projects, crypto projects in Vietnam has been really advertising and promoting it. Vietnam is actually the third largest country in terms of monthly active user on MetaMask. And Chainalysis has ranked Vietnam as number two in DeFi adoption. So you have these people in Vietnam who, you know, you will never expect, but they actually do adopt crypto and they even adopt DeFi, which, which is actually like sort of advanced level for crypto um, adoption, right? It's, it's a lot more than just buying and selling tokens in exchanges and, and speculating on it. They actually start to understand the technology a lot more and they get into farming and yield farming and DeFi and understanding different DeFi mechanisms and investing in those projects. Do we have a sense for like, yeah, exactly, exactly where their activity lies? Um, and is it mostly in gaming or mostly in DeFi or what exactly are they doing? Yeah, yeah. So the, the chain analysis reported actually like middle of last year before crypto uh, gaming really took off. So like they, Vietnam's already really big on DeFi and that's credit to one of our advisors, Coin98 and my co-founder Zane who started Coin68, which is the largest media crypto media in Vietnam. Um, since Axie, Axie Infinity also is based in Vietnam, uh, a lot of people might not know that. They started in Vietnam. The team is still that. in Vietnam. Wow. Yes, yes. Um, so, like, uh, there are a lot of great developers and builders in Vietnam that are building new innovations. And obviously, with Axie, the most successful crypto gaming, the adoption of crypto gaming in Vietnam has took up as well uh, and, and grew very big. Also, uh, with, uh, don't want to take too much credit, but Engineate is also a big force to push that. We're by far probably 10 times the largest gaming guild and influence in Vietnam in terms of crypto gaming. And we have a very active community there. Um, so like uh, in terms of both crypto, DeFi and GameFi, um, Vietnam's adoption is leading the entire world um, wow. as you know a country that's not not huge, huge, but with a hundred million population, it's the third largest monthly active user on, on MetaMask, which, which yeah. is quite fascinating. I, I got to ask the question, like, what is it about Vietnam that spurns their adoption? Are their neighbors also ranking highly or is Vietnam an outlier? 
it, it's an outlier. Um, and, and there are a couple of reasons. One, I think the, the people, they are very great people, high integrity and very excited about new technology adoption. Um, you know, their adoption in technology in mobile phone and also in gaming is also quite high in general. Uh, and they are quick to adopt new technology like blockchain. Number two, the government is very friendly. Um, there is currently no tax on crypto investment in Vietnam. Uh, and there, the government is quite open to the idea of blockchain technology. Uh, I wouldn't like in some way even embrace it uh, because I also think maybe the government realized that this is the way for the entire society to continue to grow um, and adopt new technology to really accelerate the growth. Um, and Vietnam certainly is also a very stable society where, you know, people are living a really good life. People are really happy in the, in the society. So they have time and energy to read into and understand uh, new technology like crypto and then actually adopt and try it. Yeah. You mentioned Axie is headquartered in Vietnam. Are there founders from Vietnam? Did, did those entrepreneurs come from Vietnam? Yeah. Yeah. vast majority of their teams are from Vietnam. Amazing. Yeah. That's, a, that's a incredible. I actually did not expect that, you know, that Vietnam would be such an outlier here. Um, yeah. is, I guess yeah. when, when you look at the crypto econo economy in Vietnam and, and that culture and society, um, you know, we've traced out some of the reasons why Vietnam has been so for crypto forward. Uh, but in what ways are is, is that society um, different than the crypto communities in the West? Yeah, uh, I think the the big difference there is they do recognize that this is almost one of their best opportunities to advance in terms of financial and social freedom uh, versus the West where, you know, we are already sort of privileged. And also this is one of the options we can look into. We might think this is interesting. And then, and then people in the West dive into it and then start to learn more and get on the rabbit hole. But in Vietnam, you know, because it's also a very community driven and unity driven society, people share that with each other. People share their knowledge about crypto. People share like the alpha they get in crypto and the new technology that they get excited about in crypto with each other a lot. So we really see this sort of, um, organic spread in um, awareness in crypto in Vietnam. This is going to be an interesting case study in, you know, how much will crypto adoption or, or at least being on the leading edge of crypto adoption help your com your country, your society increase economic freedom. And if they're yeah. adopting crypto, I mean, hey, then that means that they have much more democratic access to financial tooling. They have all the stuff that crypto kind of provides. And so that I would expect, I would hope, would bubble into a meaningfully different quality of life, a meaningfully different measure on the economic freedom scale. And in five, 10 years, they could be a, a dramatically different society, um, provided you know, crypto continues to scale and all this other stuff. Yeah, it, it's huge. And, and the, one of the biggest thing that crypto, one of the biggest barrier that crypto breaks is the boundary of country. Um, Vietnam wasn't able to grow as fast as they could because of the infrastructure that, you know, and historical reasons, right? Uh, the infrastructure in Vietnam is not as strong. But with crypto, it really just requires you to have a mobile phone or a computer to get access to the same resources that everywhere, everyone else in other countries have access to. Yeah. And, and we've seen because of powerful. that, you know, it's super powerful. Yeah. Uh, and just tying it all in, right? I mean, we're focusing today on play to earn economies and gaming because, you know, the meta goal here of increasing economic freedom in the world comes down to increasing crypto adoption in a lot of ways. And one of the best ways to do it is through, hey, crypto's emergence in gaming, which can bring more crypto adoption, right? And it's funny because it's the first time we've actually really used the word metaverse <laughs> in this whole conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, and we actually just recorded a podcast to try to unpack what is the metaverse? Like, what exactly do people mean when they talk about that? Um, oh, awesome. But that's that's also, you know, very just uh, bleeding edge, forward looking and, you know, again, trying to stay on the curve of adoption here. You know, we already see the future of metaverse um, as the team who's building it. Uh, and we just our goal is to help the people who are, you know, in our community uh, who, you know, are just starting to learn more about crypto and, and the metaverse to learn about it. Yeah. Anything that uh, you want to add or talk on or that we didn't we didn't discuss you think is important? I, I think, you know. Obviously, Coinbase is also very aligned with, with this mission and vision uh, to bring more and more people um, into blockchain. And I think that's sort of our goal is really to bring more people to onto blockchain. And blockchain tech is still uh, quite early today. And there's a lot of areas of improvement. And we're trying our best to build 
uh, the tools so that people are, can easily access that. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to another edition of the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. Once again, I'm Justin Mart, your host. And once again, if you have any lingering questions, comments, or thoughts, tweet at me, hit me up, engage. I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, concerns, questions, any other additions you'd love to see. Reach out to me on Twitter. I'm jmart underscore 199, as well as, again, comments on YouTube and anywhere else. Be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And catch us on the web, coinbase.com slash around the block. You'll find long form research, past podcast episodes, and a lot more. Until next week, see you then. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 